Hello and welcome. My name is Charlene K. Lau and I'm curator of the public art program at Evergreen Brickworks. Thank you so much for joining us today on this beautiful Saturday afternoon to listen in on this conversation on Rita Latonde between our artist Tannis Nielsen and curator Wanda Nanabush moderated by Ryan Rice. So we're also of course here um, on occasion of launching um, the mural Sunrise, a replication of uh, Rita Laton's Sunrise, uh, and that's been painted by Tennis Nielsen, and also Tennis's response mural Ishkade. And so we hope to see you on site very soon. Um, and, and just to speak a little bit about the public art program, um, we are working on a series of um, a curated and temporary Indigenous um, cultural um, artworks that are responding uh, to the Indigenous cultural, ecological, and industrial histories of the brickworks um, and its surrounding ravine system. And uh, this is one of our first projects um, as well that has uh, launched since, since COVID began. So very exciting to get back on site and, and have this work um, being generated and like, and what a, what a work itself. So I wanted to also thank uh, Partners in Art, Toronto Friends of the Visual Arts and the Ontario Arts Council for making this project possible, as well as the generous support of the artist and Gallery Gevick. I'd like to now offer a land acknowledgement. I'm a settler occupying land in Toronto, Treaty 13, the ancestral homelands of the Wyandot, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, and other Indigenous peoples who have camped on these lands and paddled these rivers, and those whose names we may not remember. This space is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care in a good way for the people and resources of the Great Lakes region. This territory is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island who live, work, and create in this space. On behalf of Evergreen, I am grateful to have the opportunity to share in the bounty of this territory and honor the Indigenous restoring of the lands. I'm excited to now introduce Ryan Rice, who is our moderator. Ryan Rice, Kanyangahage of Ganawake, is a curator, associate professor, and the associate dean in the Faculty of Arts and Science at OCAD U. Uh, and he's also recently been appointed Curator of Indigenous Art at the on-site gallery at OCAD U. His institutional and independent curatorial career spans 30 years in community, museums, artist-run centers, and galleries. Um, his writing on contemporary Ongoyangwe art has been published in numerous periodicals and exhibition catalogs, and he has lectured widely. He is currently working on three solo exhibitions, including Jordan Bennett, Souvenir for the on-site gallery, um, and pageant, Natalie King for Center 3 in Hamilton. Rice is currently developing two public art projects as the Indigenous Public Art Curator with Waterfront Toronto. And so I'll pass the virtual mic on now to Ryan, who will introduce Tennis Nielsen and Wanda Nambush. Thank you. Nyawagoa, uh, Charlene, and thank you for acknowledging the territories and nations on this uh, the land that which we are uh, living on and working on and creating. What uh, Wadu, I am joined today by two creative forces here on screen, and it is my pleasure to introduce them both with their brief biographies. So Tanis Nielsen, Métis of Soto, Anishinaabe and Danish descent, has 20 years of professional experience in the arts, cultural and community sectors. She holds a master's in visual studies degree from the University of Toronto and her thesis titled Not Forgotten asserted the need for localized indigenous contexts to be inserted accurately within the structure of the academy by employing visual language and culture to confront the negative consequence of colonial trauma on indigenous experiences. Her many forms of practice, interdisciplinary practice Engage with areas of anti-colonial theory, natural law, indigenous governance, arts activisms, and the relational 
investigations between indigenous science and Western quantum physics. Tanis is active in community service and contributes as an advisory member to the Native Women in the Arts and the Canadian Creative Writers uh, and Writing Program. She is also a past president of the Association of Native Development in the Performing and Visual Arts, known as AMPAVA, and she currently holds a position in the teaching intensive stream at Oakhead University and is working on a large scale public art commission for the city of Toronto. Wanda Bush, Anishinaabe Kwe from Beausoleil First Nation, holds the position of Curator Indigenous Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. A selection of her exhibitions at the AGO include Karu Ashevek in 2019, Rebecca Balmore Facing the Monumental from 2018, J.S. McLean Centre for Indigenous and Canadian Art in 2018, Toronto Tributes and Tributaries, 1971 to 1989, uh, from 2016, and Rita Latondre, Fire and Light, that was mounted in 2017. Prior to joining the AGO in 2016, Wanda held various curatorial and academic roles across Canada since 2001. In addition to indep independent curation, she held the post of Aboriginal Arts Officer at the Ontario Arts Council, the Executive Director of ANPAVA, and, a strategic, and did strategic planning for the Canada Council for the Arts. Wanda holds a master's degree in visual studies from the University of Toronto, where she has also taught graduate courses. She continues to publish widely in magazines, books, catalogs, and journals to advance a local, national, and global discourse of Indigenous and contemporary art. So I'm excited to be here today in, in dialogue with Tanis and, um, and Wanda in advance of the public unveiling to recognize Evergreen's presentation of Tanis Nielsen's major commission of the replication of artist Rita Laton's iconic mural Sunrise from 1971 and Tanis's freshly painted response piece Ishkode. Uh, the project is a celebration of both Laton's work and her legacy in, in, in Indigenous public art and muralism, as well as Tanis's creative acknowledgement, recognizing Laton's legacy and both of their dynamic ability to render movement and light. And I have uh, an image of uh, Rita Laton's uh, iconic work, Sunrise, as my uh, background. So I'd like to begin with Rita, and I'd like to begin by asking Wanda to introduce and speak a little bit about Rita's legacy, and what was the impetus to create the exhibition Fire and Light, and why is she one of Canada's important artists for us to know? Wanda? You're muted. I can't unmute myself, it, the host had control. So I was like, I figured if I kept talking, he would figure out to unmute me because <laughs> it wouldn't let me. <laughs> Don't you dare mute me. <laughs> I'll cause a mutiny. Um, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you, Ryan and Tanis. And, um, and to talk about um, the beautiful human being that is Rita Latonde and the force, creative force that she is. Um, I first met Rita in the 80s, when she was in her 80s. Not, not when I, not the 80s, I was a little young. <laughs> um, but when she was in her 80s and she was still uh, producing prolifically at the time and had a little, bit of a conversation about her career. And she had said to me that she never really felt like Toronto embraced her. So she was still considered to be from Montreal, from um, uh, because she was French, I think also, and also because um, she had been living here, you know, since the seventies, but they, we hadn't embraced her in, in, a, in a, a certain kind of way. Um, so, that's just to say like some of the impetus why I chose Rita Latonda as my second major exhibition at the AGO. Um, I had um, the offer to do a solo exhibition of anybody of my choosing. And I chose Rita because she was the most senior artist in our community. And I felt like had not been given a major retrospective in Toronto yet um, and hadn't been given a retrospective for quite a number of years. And so Rita Latonde, I'll give a bit of a bio just for those who may not know, um, was 
moved to Montreal in the 1940s, ended up attending um, art school there, um, mostly because of a, a patron of her coffee, coffee shop who had talked her into um, going to the Beaux-Arts kind of schools, not something she ever would have considered as you know, a poor Quebecer. It's not something that just comes so naturally. She was also uh, part Abenaki and her father was part Haudenosaunee, um, but that part they don't know anything about. So she really kind of only connects to her Abenaki roots. Um, and during her studies, she ended up becoming friends with the automatists and being deeply influenced by uh, Paul Emile Bourdois and the Refuse Global, um, um, what do you call that when it's like a revolutionary text? Um, so they're revolutionary text, <laughs> which really wanted freedom, freedom from representation, representational art, but also freedom for intuition, emotion, um, to kind of enter into artistic practice and for the work to come from a place that they felt was pretty pure in that sense. Um, and so Rita entered that world and she really still held on to that as the essence of her work all the way through. Um, and she was phenomenal right away. Right away, people were snapping her up. Um, she's spread internationally into New York, into uh, Europe into Israel so she's shown a lot she has a lot of public murals in in uh, North America um, so she maintained a really really strong career all the way through she was the only woman in that group um, and that is something uh, kind of amazing when you start reading about her artic the articles on her that were written at the time in the 19th late 1940s early 50s and they kept asking like how is this woman able to create such masculine you know things and then there's this one article that blames it on her Abenaki heritage it's just the strangest um, confluence of things that you see happening in the reviews of her and I think they couldn't make sense you know she was so um, out of the realm of what was acceptable for for a woman and especially an Abenaki woman um, at that time. So she's groundbreaking in a number of levels, um, not just in her art, but also in who she is. And she's never ever kind of backed down on, on who she is. She's held to it and held strong all the way through. And um, you'll see the two kinds of styles of her work behind me here. So she has this kind of gestural style, which is based in oil. And then she has a more acrylic hard edge style, which she is more widely known for. Um, depending on what's going on in her life, she deals with really harsh events in her life, whether um, like the death of her husband through this more gestural style. Um, so you can really see that through her career. Um, yeah, so I think she's a, you know, a really groundbreaking artist um, who was working at a time when women weren't really working, and she has continued to be groundbreaking for the last, you know, 60 years, 70 years. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so here we are, and, and thank you, Wanda, for bring, bringing her career to light for many people who would have totally missed out on her, her work. Um, me included, like I've only known of Rita just because she was in Quebec and like there wasn't much to go on in terms of understanding who she was and her relationships. Um, and it, and it, you know, this is our job as indigenous people, indigenous curators is to uplift our community and to write that history that has been historically excluded or written from a different perspective. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm gonna turn over to Tanis. And uh, um, in the video accompanying this project, which I encourage everyone to uh, watch, uh, which is available on YouTube, uh, Tanis, you speak about the fact that like many of us, you weren't familiar with Rita's career, work, or Abenaki heritage. While she was recognized as a Quebec Quebecois artist associated, as Wanda mentioned, the automatists and the Les, Les Plasticiens movements, her practice was not positioned to her indigeneity directly. In doing this commission project and the response piece, can you talk about what you've learned about her and the practice of what you talk about in the video as a gesture of reciprocity and response, 
as well as just you just moments ago, you talked about how this project nourished your spirit. So could you uh, could you share a little bit about this experience and what you're taking away from from diving deep in, in, in from a creative uh, perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I spent eight years at the University of Toronto, and I was never introduced to Rita Latond in an art and art history uh, program. <laughs> and, you know, I think what would have happened with my own aesthetic and conceptual interests if I were introduced to her back then, right? Like, how would I have evolved my practice having been inspired 20 years ago by being introduced to her? So I feel like I really, really missed out. And so I am also really grateful to Wanda for uh, prioritizing and giving precedence in the platform to such an iconic artist. Um, so uh, Rita and I, like, we differ aesthetically. Um, but I find like we have similar interests conceptually. And um, one of the things too, in terms of our context, just like as indigenous women are these, you know, barriers to access. And, you know, she was living um, in her childhood uh, life in, in poverty and um, her paintings really connote like her resiliency through that. And I was looking at a few of her quotes where she talked about, um, you know, being afraid of a storm, but then her mother showed her what was beautiful about it. And that difficulty can have its own beauty and you could fight it and you could win, which is a quote from Rita. And she said, you don't accept darkness, you pass through it and you win. So. Yeah, it's been a kind of difficult year with the quarantine and the isolation, but I've had this wonderful opportunity to be down at Evergreen, um, surrounded by beautiful, you know, land and environmentally protected area, as well as a historic site for um, the people, you know, the fishing weirs, and um, there's also all of our relations, like there's turtles and there's deer, you know, so I'm painting my response and painting her work and listening to music. And the process is much more important to me than the final product, which I've not yet achieved, but the, through the process, um, it's really worked to lift my spirit. Like I mentioned previously that a healer once told me I gave all my colors away and that I needed to bring them back. So doing this, actually, I could feel the nourishment of my spirit coming back. Um, like I'm drinking these colors, right? And it's really lifting um, me mentally and emotionally and, and spiritually for sure. Um, so I've often told my students, like if you wanna really get to know an artist, like reproduce their work. And even though I teach from Anishinaabe pedagogy, I am a fan of the pedagogy from the Royal Academy too, to learn um, the principles and elements of design through say copying a Proudhon, right? And then once you learn the form, please abstract it, get rid of it and, you know, do your own form and abs abstraction and stuff. So um, I found it was like really difficult to do her work and um yeah and then the response has been like the most difficult painting i've ever done in my life and i'll i'll get into that a little bit later but um i think you're asking mostly about like a similarity of our experience and my relationship to rita and her work so i say um we differ aesthetically but i said we meet um con conceptually which is uh, our interest in science, right? She said once too that if she were not an artist, that she would have been a scientist, right? And if I were not an artist, I actually wanted to be an architect. And I just didn't have the math, right? Like I quit school grade seven, eight, nine, but I would still love to design um, buildings and spaces. And I'm happy to recently be getting involved in looking at place and public art and working with some architects recently on a, on a project. Um, but our interest in science, so 
I'm currently got a piece at Agnes Etherton that's looking at uh, cosmology, the Big Bang, and quantum mechanics, and he talks about the four fundamental forces of nature, which is static, electric, what, electromagnetic energy, gravity, and the strong and weak nuclear force. And when I look at you know Laton's work, like it's all there, right? You know these mass compositions where you literally feel the weight of. Um, you know, the laws of motion as described by Isaac Newton, which are still the theories that we're using today, as well as the elements that are fundamental to our life, uh, earth, air, water, and fire. And I saw too, um, she was talking about how the Abenaki are known as the people of the dawn. So the focus on like the sunrise and like the grandfather um, has been a prominent theme in her work. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling. Um, and then there's my reproduction, which I'll show visually later. Um, we meet, so aesthetically, I'm like this impressionist kind of person on the outer edges in this atmospheric uh, transparent perspective that meets in the middle with this hard edge um, line. And I think that's where we meet in this geometric kind of symmetry place. but I think Rita's work is slightly off symmetry, which when you look at uh, cosmology and the birth of the universe, the just being slightly off symmetry, like the, with there just being a little bit more matter than antimatter is like what gave birth to the whole universe, right? Because if it was like equal parts of matter and antimatter, it would have stayed like this fluid space, right? So I think it's interesting that, yeah, she's working with these geometric forms, but they're always just slightly off um, symmetry. And um, when I was reproducing her work, first I had to go into Photoshop and I was like doing mirroring and things. And I thought, wow, it's like really incredible that in the seventies, like with her hard edge work that, you know, as well, that she was able to find like this reverb in line, right? Like when I look at all her works, not just the hard edge work, but the loose gestural work, it kind of has like this electric kind of hum, you know, where you hear, right? <laughs> so, um, which reminds me then of uh, Leroy Little Bear's concept of flux and that animated uh, life force. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but I think, yeah, we're, we differ very much um, aesthetically, but we come together in terms of our context of indigenous women and the barriers that we've had to face. And then um, conceptually, our, our interests are, are rather aligned. And I think I probably went off your question on that. No, no, you totally, you totally answered it. And okay. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking like how you, how you talk about, Rita mentions the earth and sky and the ground. And, you know, this, this mural is situated, you know, on a skyscraper in the sky and I'm just wondering what what was your approach bringing it down to the ground? So now it's it's all it's on Earth, right? It's touching the ground. It it has, it's not in the sky anymore. Did you think of that as, within the uh, process of putting this rep, uh, reproduction together? No, I didn't. But that's like a really excellent point. And I was just thinking, I'm glad it's in the eastern direction because when you're at Evergreen. Um, and you want to look towards the sunrise so you're standing like let's say you're standing at mine which is inspired by a sunset so mine is actually geographically on the western part of evergreen and rita's is in the east so that's really great that we didn't think about it but it ended up that way um bringing it down to the ground um you know, I think I'd prefer to see it in the sky, though it is nice down on the ground and I'm glad it's geographically positioned in the east, but um, it is such a shame that that mural and like the, you know, in Gothic architecture, they say height and light to as a inspiration towards like Catholic uh, ideology, right? But the height and light of like Rita's mural, it does cause me to like lift my chin up and put my shoulders back, which like just that physical change creates a mental change, uh, an emotional change. And so I really wish I could still see it on the wall 
at that height on that building. Um, with it down lower on the ground, um, you, you feel wrapped in it, I think. Like, um, I see a lot of people taking their pictures in front of it, and it it kind of acts like a, a star blanket then. Oh, interesting, you know? interesting, yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, going to this iconic work that was produced in 1971, it's seven stories high on this building of Jarvis and Carlton. Um, I'm wondering, Wanda, if from a curator's perspective, uh, what do you think Rita accomplished uh, and activated through these public art projects and murals that we need to know about, especially in Toronto, because this wasn't the only one uh, that she produced here. Um, and, you know, anything in your research and, and how Sunrise is iconic and very influential and probably, you know, has been pushed back in, in Torontonians or Toronto's memory, right, in terms of, you know, how does it exist? And, you know, this, this image is something, one of the only images behind me that I only have consistently seen of this work. So yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right about the, the way it lives in people's memory. So I'll just give a bit of a background on the piece itself for those who don't know, but it was in 1970 when the Art Gallery of Ontario did a competition um, and they invited 10 artists to, to suggest a, a large mural. Um, and it was part of some Benson and Hedges art initiative or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> not the important part um but anyway so she was the only woman invited they were all the rest were men and um she actually which is really interesting Tannis I don't know if you know this but her original design is for a sunset so she actually was doing a sunset first and they were full of purples and blues and then um when when it came to the site which was the Neil Wysick um, college at 96 Gerard Street East near Church and Wellesley. For those of you who want to go see it, you now have to squeeze between two buildings because there's a high rise that has grown up and covered it. So she won the competition. And then when she saw this, yeah, in the skyness of it, she thought sunrise, right? And she, she developed this, um, you know, like the, even the corner edge actually amplifies the arrows rather than, because if they were just going to go straight off the building, they would, it's actually less, less tension and less sense of, 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 a, of rays kind of spreading out. So um, yeah, it's a really in incredible design. So when it came out, like the city was in love with this work. People would go see it and you could see it um, because the city was different in the seventies. You could see it as, as an icon like CN Tower. So everywhere you looked, you could see the CN Tower and you could see this, this mural. <laughs> so it was really a sign of Toronto too. Um, and it had such a, a hopeful feeling and a hopeful message too, you know, through, through such a really, really dramatic changing time. And um, so then when the, this high rise was supposed to go up, um, there were protests like the community came out in protest, Ryerson students uh, protested. Um, the Ryerson students did a time-lapse video also of the skyscraper going up and covering it as it was built, um, but I cannot find it. So researchers out there, please help me find this darn video. Um, <laughs> I really wanted to put it in the show and I couldn't because I couldn't find it. Um, somebody out there has it, I know. <laughs> Anyway, so they did this, it was a real sense of mourning in the city, you know, and so then they ended up giving another building um, to her to do another mural. Uh, that one was called, what was it? Uh, I forget the name of it. Um, but it was on a building, the building they ended up giving her ended up having like a, a facade that was crumbling and falling apart. So in that mural disappeared. So they kept giving her these mural spaces and, and different kinds of, um, you know, train station. Her train station piece was just reinstituted recently again, you know, with the glass and the light. Um, so I think that there, there was this real love for her 
but also this real erasure at the same time, a constant erasing, erasing, erasing. Um, so it's beautiful that now, now we get to honor, honor her again, so. Yeah, it really would be amazing to see that, like, you know, one of the only, it was, you know, it's like the Batman beacon light, right? Here it is, Rita the Tongue, that's super. Batman, for sure. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yeah, so it's seven, and just so you know, it's like seven floors of the building. It's 18 meters high, 18 by 18. Yeah, and that massive, massive project and, and really important. And now we're 50 years later, you know, talking about this work and uncovering it for, you know, new generations, I guess, in, in different kinds of ways and different audiences. But, you know, through that process, 50 years later, Tannis, you were invited to create a response piece. So um, I'd like to ask you to uh, give us a, a sneak peek and introduce and tell us a little bit about this piece titled Ishkode. Sure. Let me share my screen. Um, sorry, I know you see all these little uh, canvas frames in front of you. <laughs> this is a, well, what I did is I looked on Google for uh, sunsets and then I cut and cropped a sun ray from a sunset and I manipulated it by mirroring it and saturating the colors in Photoshop. And this is when I was like, wow, how did Rita know about these lines in the 70s? Because like, I didn't see these lines in the sunset and, until I brought it into Photoshop, right? And so I just think she's an incredible, masterful visionary. And so this is my intention. This is the source that I'm working from that was manipulated in Photoshop. Ishkade translates to fire, which um, some would say is a male element, right? But then I'm actually um, getting a lot of comments on how the work actually also looks like a female body part, <laughs> right? Like a vagina. <laughs> and I'm fine with that interpretation. Um, maybe fi a fire doesn't have to be in this uh, gender binary kind of thing, right? You know? Um, so it's great. Wanda, that you told me that originally she was going to do the sunset with the reds and the purples and, and everything. And um, the work really has like a glow on its own already, the one that I'm doing just because of the color contrast, well, the comp, comp, um, complementary colors. And it changes color throughout the day. So here you could see, can you see? Um, whoops the purple and pinks that it shows in the day, yeah. And then at night, it turns into like this rich kind of brown. And then what I've been trying to do is to turn acrylic exterior house paint into the behavior and character and persona of a fine art oil paint, which has been um, a ridiculous, uh, well, not ridiculous, uh, but it's been a very hard and trying thing to do. And so my new advice to students is never be innovative or experimental on a public art piece that has a deadline, <laughs> like know your shit before you go in, right? And um, so I've been mixing like one part pigment to four parts uh, glaze to try and get this atmospheric perspective, perspective happening, right? With the translucency. And it's kind of working, but it leaves a lot of brush strokes. So then I recently just got yesterday um, some translucent spray paints, and I'll show you those. Because what I'm trying to do is um, this is a Renaissance effect, right? Where the work will, um, so here you can see the glow of the color. 
and then it'll glow even more so when we do this to it. So this is what I'm going to do next. This is, I just took the transparent spray paint at home and went over an old 12 year old painting self portrait I had myself with the transparent sprays and and you could see that they kind of act like a window so which with each layer of glaze and with each layer of transparent sprays it'll give the depth a uh, increased depth of recession which will increase the depth of recession in um thinking about like the atmosphere and this and the sky right so um what was the question though <laughs> Sorry. I was just asking you to give a preview and, uh, you know, oh, talk yeah. about this new work. I mean, and it's interesting how science is a big part of the process of what you're doing, right? Like, oh, you, yeah. you talk about understanding that and now then you start telling us about the these chemical mixtures that you're doing to create light. It's, it's, it's you know, part and parcel of, of what you and Rita have been doing. Yeah, yeah. It's been really... Um a frustrating process, but I think I've got it all together now. <laughs> but my one friend, a fellow alumni, uh, Drew Daniel, made a really interesting point the other day under a comment on the response. She said she liked, she thinks I'm decolonizing the public art mural process. Because if you look at the Simcoe mural too, right? Um, you know, it's taken me like three years, but it's like, if it were vertical, it would stand 14 stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. So I don't feel so bad that it's taken me so long. I also didn't have the time with the pandemic last year to touch it, but um, decolonizing the process, because a lot of mural artists or public uh, painters just get in and get out like as fast as they can. And I don't, right? Like I just, I'm not leaving the piece until I'm really happy with it. And, um, you know, I, I do these details and multiple layers and I find that knock on wood, um, none of my murals have ever been tagged yet. Like, except for the portions that beg for being tagged, like a frame with a black space and nothing in it. Somebody drew SpongeBob, right? You know, but it's begging for a tag there, but nobody has actually ever tagged over a drawing or a painting or the line or the tonal work or anything that I've done so far, knock on wood. And I think hopefully it's because the street artists kind of respect the work and also respect that it's an in indigenous form, right? So knock yeah. on wood, everybody. Yeah, that's great. I mean. I mean, it adds such a, like, you know, what was historically excluded now comes forefront by, by you know, there's a, there's a greater visibility of indigenous presence in Toronto than there has been in the past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look back at Sunrise and, and you're thinking 50 years ago, this was installed. And, you know, can, we can probably count in between Sunrise to now, you know, that those discrepancies in, in sort of, it's a metaphor of how Indigenous people are represented within, within Canadian cities in a lot of ways, right? Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. You could type in a question in your chat if you do have one. Uh, I'm also gonna ask Wanda if you have any questions uh, for Tanis. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you think uh, that you this has put you on a different path, like for a next body of work? Oh my goodness. I don't know why I feel like crying all of a sudden. <laughs> 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 yeah, wow, I want to turn off my video. <laughs> but these are good, happy tears. Um, sorry. Yeah, I've been affected like profoundly in a really positive way doing the response because of the colors and because of the gestures and um, because of the scale, like I'm in it. And <laughs> Charlene knows I don't really want to leave it. It's like, come on, Tannis, what's taking you so long with this mural, right? 
And I painted the landscape once, you know, it took me two years and it didn't have to take me two years, but I didn't want to leave it. And Travis Schilling said to me when he saw it, he's like, you know, that interior that you did in that way is very difficult. I'm like, well, I was inside it and I didn't want to leave it. He's like, I can tell, right? And I think the same thing is happening with this. It's really become um, a healing space for me to be in. And I'm definitely like um, a lot of my landscapes and portraiture before were only minimally abstracted. And I am teaching indigenous abstraction and I taught like Western abstraction. The, what I, you know, I talk about the colonization of abstraction and all that, but um, I'm definitely going to be less representational. Like even with the static thing, like with the work at the Agnes Etherton, I, I said there are two iterations and one of them had some representational stuff in it and then the second one i i got rid of all representation i said to emily we don't need any representational right you know and i'm reminded by uh james baldwin you know on his advice for writing he said write the sentence as clean as the bone mm -hmm. so i'm thinking um with the future works definitely more minimal to be able to say all that need be said with with as few elements as possible as the effect that Rita has had on on me and also um, the healing and the need to use color and, and wear color is uh, also a good reminder, which is part of our ceremonial ways too, right? So, mm -hmm. thanks. sorry I got all... There are, uh, I never apologize. <laughs> <laughs> It's your true authentic self coming forward about your experience and it's beautiful. Um, we're gonna be opening up uh, guests to turn on their cameras and if any of them have a question, they can also uh, uh, prompt us to, to know if they, they have a question. But I have a question from Charlene. Uh, replication and reenactment of indigenous public art is one rep reparative act in art history. What are other reparative acts that might uncover or reinscribe Indigenous artwork in art history and beyond? Reparative acts that will what? That might... that might uncover and reinscribe Indigenous artwork in art history and beyond. Well, I just think of NAGPRA. <laughs> the in the United States, there's a Native American Graves and Repatriation Act that Canada, I think, need develop its own uh, form of NAG right here in terms of like reparative acts and the, the uncovering of um, art. Um, it's like we say land back, but also belongings back too is something that I would suggest. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just add to that that these reparative acts is access for our own communities to have two belongings that we have had been so separated from. And whether that is within a public realm or within an institution, like that welcoming and hospitality has to be, that access has to be there for us in order for those reparative acts to take place in, in any situation. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what happened to the piece on Davenport, just east of Av? Does anybody know about this work? I'm just looking it up right now in my book because we covered them all in the AGO catalog. <laughs> what happened to them <laughs> at the back? So I was like, which one is that one? Um, I don't know it off by heart. So, and Davenport, um, she created a dynamic composition of two dark wedges confronting one another diagonally. It was like a black and white with gray in it. Um, and um, it was just painted over basically, like literally just painted over for no good reason. I guess at this time, I'm just wondering if either either one of you have any last uh, words or thoughts since there's no other questions coming forward, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of close the conversation. Uh, 
um, and, and, you know, prompt us to get out to Evergreen and see this work. Like, I, I'm really excited about going see the work and, uh, you know, having that, being embraced by what you just shared with us. Mm -hmm. Completely. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Both works, the sunrise and sunset. Um, I would say that uh, um, I do think that, th I was just thinking about that reparative act question a little longer, but I do think that these ways in which we bring forth those histories that are kind of forgotten or left aside or buried, or, you know, these are, these are ways in which we are writing a new history and like creating a different future. Um, so I think that those, any, any which way <laughs> that people can support that kind of work is, is really, you know, supporting indigenous work on indigenous art is something that I think is necessary because mm -hmm. we see differently. <laughs> yeah, and then um, the average pedestrian seeing those works is then reminded of, you know, territory and where they're actually located, right? Like all of these works I see as being, you know, land acknowledgements and, and reminders to the pedestrians of where they actually are. Do you have a statement that will be uh, accompanying the, the works uh, for public consumption or QR code or? No, <laughs> but that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I could write a statement. In my, in my older age, in my career, I'm like, I'm so pro label and information now compared to in the past where like, you don't need the information, let the <laughs> artists speak for themselves. <laughs> and it's probably the educational, you know, path that I have veered off onto, but, but I find it very, to make it so accessible, people respond like so incredibly to the narratives of the land and what, what indigenous people are sharing in, in these uh, projects. Well, that's the necessity of what need be shared too, right? Like we talk about what shouldn't really should what we should keep to ourselves and the things that should be shared. And I'm thinking, yeah, like land stewardship, you know, the protection of water and um, teachings of and about with for on behalf of land water. That's what need be shared for sure and increased access to because the, that's the only way we're going to save the planet and humanity, you know, so. For sure. I see Charlene has joined us. I'm going to turn it over to Charlene. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tannis. Thank you, Wanda. I actually have one last question because I was quite taken by um, Tannis, what you were saying about um, art and science and thinking about how um, very often in what I have learned in Western art traditions is that art and science are separate. But of course, as we know that they're absolutely not. So I just wondered if you wanted to riff a little bit off that and just talk about how, like a more holistic view of, you know, the interconnectedness um, of art and science or, you know, like anything more broadly. Well, I think uh, Western science started out in a good way with like early alchemy, right? So the early alchemists recognized the sentient qualities of the elements. So they would collect the morning dew because they recognized its medicinal properties. But then I think with um, Christianity and, um, you know, people started getting burned at the stake for believing in that, right? And you let's see what happened to scientists when they said, no, the earth is round or whatever, right? So, um, but then, you know, you look at Da Vinci and, you know, the artists, scientists working together holistically. I think it's, um, as a visual artist, there's um, a want to look at, like, microscopically or universally like in terms of like cosmos right and then you see that like the micro is like the same structure as the macro right and um and i want to know form and function so like 
how does the universe function and how do I visually depict that form, right? And then like listening to Stephen Hawkins, like he says it's a self-sufficient universe. And then um, there's another uh, scientist who says like the brain model, which is like based on string theory, says that the universe um, has 11 possible different uh, dimensions. And then so I'm, I'm listening to this, and then I feel like in my mind, the vision that comes with my listening. So I'm just listening to YouTube, you know, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse uh, lectures to a pedestrian audience, which I am, because I don't pretend to know all of this. But then I get these visions in my head of uh, what they're talking about. I feel like I'm almost at a Pink Floyd laser light show, <laughs> right? And then I just want to get it down. I want to, I want to, I want to draw it or I want to paint it or, um, you know, and, and I, and understand the, the function and um, depict it in my own kind of innovative form, right? So like um, the principles and elements of design and form, like how do you make that geometric ray have a reverb? you know, that reflects uh, that concept of flux and um, electromagnetic energy. And then how do you create a composition that gives the depth, the weight of gravity, right? You know, um, I think that artists too, like I always say to my students, we're all multidisciplinary. There should really be no programs or departments, right? Cause it's kind of all holistic because nobody's just a painter. You know, yeah. I I I ranted on my riff. All all good. Um, no, thank you for that. And just thinking, yeah, about art at Evergreen. Um, thinking about art and the environment, and not just like the environment, but our environment collectively, and what that means, and how to respond to that but at the same time while respecting that of course I think first and foremost is a respect for the environment which includes um the social and cultural sphere um and so yeah just uh, as we mo move forward thinking about how to um really work on that I think as as uh, in, in terms of the art program but just you know personally so anyway thank you for bringing that all around um I guess we're reaching the end, we're almost at three o'clock. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us again today. Um, and especially, of course, to our speakers, to Tanis for doing the beautiful replication and the response, which now I'm going to think about as being maybe like a Pink Floyd light show, even though I never saw it at the McLaughlin Plantarium. But now I'm like, oh, yeah, and it, that electricity which we've talked about. So thank you so much for that work. I, I was 50, you know, it's really funny. Uh, one time I was on the lift and there was this nice gentle breeze and I pressed the button to go up on the lift. So I'm like, mm, going up and Pink Floyd, the song, breathe, breathe in the air, right? Came on. <laughs> it's just like, oh, incredible. Yeah. What a moment. No, it's been a joy working with you and looking forward to seeing you again on site very soon. And also thank you, Wanda, for just sharing your insights and your expertise um, with having worked with Rita's work um, and having curated the exhibition, which I wish I had seen. Uh, unfortunately, I was not living in Toronto at that time, but I'll definitely have a look at the catalog. And to Ryan for doing an amazing job moderating and also um, hoping to work further with you and, and speak to you also on, on your roles. Um, and your new projects coming up. So very exciting, lots of things happening. And, and finally, um, and just thanking again, uh, all of you out there um, from Toronto, Friends of the Visual Arts and PIA for joining us here and for really providing the support for which, you know, if we didn't have that, this project would not be possible. And um, the OAC, of course, um, and to Rita for this, ongoing legacy um which has brought us all here together today um yes so thanks so much hope you all enjoy your uh the rest of your saturday afternoons and 
yeah, hope to see you soon, um, in person or or online. I miss you guys. Take care. Bye, Ona. Bye. Bye, Ma.